Okay, so Bottle Baby Program, um, we only have 30 minutes to cover this. Um, the, the strategy that we employed here is to copy the, this wildlife center that I worked at part-time, and they had a, um, an open admission policy for wildlife, and they did not euthanize. So they um, took in tons and tons and tons of babies, squirrels and raccoons and skunks and um, possums, and everything you can think of, they took it. And they set up these rooms throughout their building, and each room was dedicated to neonatal babies during the, the spring and summer. And they would just line up crates of, of the wildlife, and the, they would have an intern start at one side and go through and feed a kennel, wash their hands, feed another, wash their hands, feed another, and they would just work their way around the room. And the beauty of it was that by the time they finished all that, it was time to feed again, so they would just start all over. And it was a good, efficient use of manpower. Um, of course, it depends on how many you have. But, um, but So we decided to try that because we didn't have enough foster homes that wanted to stay up all night with bottle babies. And we, our shelter was euthanizing them um, on intake, of course, because there was nobody to take them. And so they, they didn't see the reason in letting them suffer because there was nobody to feed them. And we, it, we would see about 1,200 a year euthanized. So we knew we had a significant problem. We knew this was a big chunk of our um, euthanasia list that we needed to figure out a solution for, and so that's why we came up with this strategy. And we didn't have a building, so we bought an Airstream-type trailer and set it up in a busy part of town. Um, and the idea was that we could get more volunteers if it was visible and more donations, and, um, and it works pretty well. So that trailer was our bottle baby ward at the beginning. And... Um, we had volunteers and fosters coming in. Um, the fosters, the, it, just, just because we have the ward doesn't mean we actually want the kittens in the ward. It's just a safety net. So the whole point of this is to give them more time so you can find foster. So it's hard because we keep struggling with a bunch of kittens ending up in the ward and not leaving because the pressure to find the foster is off as soon as we take them out of the shelter. And that can't be the case because then you just get stuck with tons of babies and you can't take more in when you're full um, or they don't get the care that they need. So having the push for fosters, foster push has to be just as urgent as getting them out of the shelter within the two hours or whatever time frame they give you. Here's our bottle baby organizational chart. It was all volunteer until last year. Um, and we had these people set up. Our very first year, we saved about 250. The second year, I think, was about 500. And then the third year, when we got paid staff, um, we were saving 800. And then um, this year, we're, it's, we've had a kitten explosion. It's like 2,000. But um, we've had to try to incrementally find funds to pay people to be there because when, the more kittens there are, the more, um, obviously, labor-intensive it is. But all of these volunteer positions are really great because a lot of them can be done from home. A lot of people work for APA at their real work, and that's uh, good for us because they're in front of a computer. They can network. They can do other stuff. Um, so we try to farm out all of these positions to volunteers. Two other um, important positions is just communicating with the, um, the rescue manager and the adoption so that we can be moving them efficiently through our system if they don't get into foster. So um, we talked about positive messaging earlier. Uh, that's how we get volunteers and fosters for these guys. Um, we talk about how great it is to save their lives. We've, we post cute videos of how adorable they are when they grow up. Um, getting people to come to volunteer is not a problem. The hard part is keeping them. And so uh, we try really hard to make it fun. We have shift leaders that bring donuts, and, you know, they try to keep their volunteers engaged because you put a lot of work into the volunteers to train them so they do it right, and you, if there's constant turnover, it's really frustrating and leads to poor morale for everybody else. Um, but there is turnover, so you have to expect that, but you try to keep it under control. We have specific protocols. I included a lot of them in the, in the uh, handouts. Um, we have protocols. We followed basically what the Wildlife Center did on intake. We weigh them. We assess hydration. We look for parasites. Um, we try to see if there's any evidence of upper respiratory or diarrhea and um, ringworm so that we're not accidentally spreading that throughout the ward. We have illness protocols. Fading kittens, the most important one. That's, that's one that the um, volunteers do. Uh, we, we used to rush them all over to the vet clinic to do um, IV dextrose. We found that we can't even find a vein on most of them most of the time. 
So we started, and, and it wastes precious time, so we started doing a protocol where the volunteers burrito them up in a heating pad, try to get their temperature back up. They do oral um, caro or sugar water. They make up their own sugar water con concoction. And, um, and then if they make it, which about 50% of them do, we start them on an antibiotic. A lot of times we don't know what caused it, but we think that it's septic in nature that makes them fade. Um, usually there's something brewing GI-wise from a, a food change, diet change, or they've got upper respiratory brewing. So we do start them. It's an empirical, just, you know, no science behind it treatment, but um, we'll start them on something just so that we're, we're not in the same boat 24 hours later is the hope. We have feeding schedules and recipes that we use that are very specific. So there's not a lot of um, creativity going on with the volunteers. We don't want them to be creative. We want them to follow the exact same protocol so that every animal gets consistent care. And um, we test on intake. And it, um, we test for feline leukemia if they're under four weeks old. If they're positive, we do, we, and if they're too small, we'll just wait and do a serum test later. But if they're negative, um, even if they're negative, we will test again when they get spayed and neutered, just to make sure that, they, that we didn't miss that window from three to four weeks of the first three to four weeks of age where they could be incubating feline leukemia and not actually have it yet. Um, charts, this is a chart that we, again, stole directly from the, the Wildlife Center. And it has all their information on it. It has the date and time. The volunteer fills it out. They, um, they weigh them before they eat. Weighing them is critical because these guys, they weigh almost nothing. So you can't tell when they lose weight. A significant amount of weight for them is imperceptible to us. So we weigh them before they eat. And then after they eat, a lot of times um, you can detect a trend. Um, also, you can tell if they're not eating, especially when they get to gruel. They'll wear all the gruel, and they might not have actually gotten any of it in their mouth. And if you're not weighing them after they eat, you don't know until the next time you go to feed them, and then they've dropped more. And every time they drop weight between feedings, you're, there's a problem happening, and you need to be on top of it. And the faster you catch it, the faster, the more likely you are to save them. The typical diseases, there's a, a, a handout on this too, but we typically see upper respiratory. Um, we see diarrhea. We see sometimes vomiting and diarrhea. We don't typically test for panleukopenia unless they are... Um, unless we're having an outbreak, which we are this summer. Um, but typically, we don't test for it. We just isolate them um, because there's some uncertainty with the test and um, vaccine interference. The ringworm, we don't treat them immediately uh, because they're so little. Once they get a little bit bigger, we'll start using oral medications and maybe Lyme dips. Uh, fleas, we treat with Capstar or a tea tiny drop of Frontline. Um, Constipation is a normal or a routine problem that we see. If they're not eating, we'll start tube feeding if we have the manpower. If we don't, and, and kittens are not able to thrive, even though we're trying to help them as much as we can, we don't go to the ends of the earth to try to save them. We're trying to give them a safety net so that the healthiest can survive. We give them some backup with medication and treating what we see, but um, we lose some, and we don't, you know, we're not hospitalizing these guys. We're not doing any really heroic treatment to try to save them. Um, all, almost all of them get sick with something, and the longer they're in the ward, the more likely that is to happen. That's just the nature of the beast. Fading kitten syndrome, we already talked about. Um, these are the things that are really important to have. We need, it needs to be a self-sufficient ward with a microwave and fridge. We use snuggle-safe discs instead of heating pads. Um, that's another donor-friendly thing because they're expensive, um, but if you can tie it to saving lives, people like to donate for, thing, for things that don't get thrown away. Um, we use uh, scales are critical. I've, you know, I already said that. Uh, we have a smock for each kennel. So every, every kennel, um, you go in, and they have a basket sitting on top of the kennel, and you pull the basket down, you put on the smock and um, gloves, and and take care of the kittens. And if the, if the kittens are harboring something, the idea is that we're not going to spread it to the next cage because you have to take that all off and then put another garb set. But instead of having that much laundry pile, off, pile up, we just keep it for the next shift so that it goes into their basket again. And um, that works pretty well. Keeping your hair tied back is important so your hair is not getting contaminated and then contaminating the next kitten. We use KMR, and the reason we use KMR is because it's accessible to everybody. So if these guys go home to foster, fosters are responsible for paying for their own milk, and, um, and they do pretty happily. And if they run out of milk in the middle of the night, they can find KMR at the grocery or at a PetSmart or Petco. 
the, um, uh, the other, and then if we run out in the middle of the night, we can also find it. So we don't order anything that has to, you know, only comes through the mail. And we try to keep everybody on a consistent diet. We love the dry kitten food, the royal cane and baby cat kibble. It's awesome because it's so tiny and they can start eating it really young. Problem is it's so expensive. So without a donor, it's not, it doesn't make sense to go buy that. Um, so our coverage, it's mostly volunteers still. It's a huge labor-intensive pro- program. It's our most labor-intensive program. And it is, um, it, even with staff, paid staff now, we have volunteers have to, have to be a critical piece of this. You can't do it without a lot of people helping. We have shift leaders that are typically volunteers. Um, we also we keep a feeder board where we write down each kitten's animal ID number um, or, or the cage uh, number and the litter. Like we, we name the litters according to an um, alphabet chart. So the very first litter of the year are the A1s, and then the next litter are the B1s, the next litter are the C1s. And then that way we can keep track of kind of where we are in the season. Um, it's easier to find them later, and they get names, like an A name if they're in the A1, and they have to have different names from the previous A group, so um, the, the feeders really enjoy naming them. But it also helps us to keep track, because they're too little to microchip. That's the other thing we could try to do, but that's really hard on a little tiny kitten. I don't think anybody would sign up to be the one that does it. Um, and communication. Okay, so that's the hardest part. We have volunteers coming in the middle of the night. Sometimes they never see each other. How do you communicate about the care of these kittens and to make sure that um, there's some consistency and continuity of care? And um, we have different ways of doing that. We have a Google Calendar sign-up. It's really easy. Anybody can sign up and put their name down for a shift uh, once they go through training. They don't have access to the calendar until they go through a training period. The, we do reminder emails. We have a Yahoo group where people can talk amongst themselves on the, the rescue group, I mean on the Bottle Baby Yahoo group. And the pros of that is it's open communication. The cons are that you get all these crazy things being talked about that have nothing to do with kittens and um, take you right off track of just trying to help the kittens. But, uh, but overall, I think it's a pro. We also keep a daily log, and we write notes in the chart, and we use notes on the whiteboard. So we try to communicate in every way possible. The typical course, they're picked up from the shelter. The, the shelter gives us two hours because they don't want them to suffer. So we have a transport system that is, they, they email our rescue team, and our rescue team has somebody on, it's a Google group, and there's one person from each rescue department, each animal department on there. And we have Rescue Cat and Rescue Dog at AustinPetsLive.org. And Rescue Cat goes to everybody. It goes to the barn cat person. It goes to the bottle baby person. It goes to the cat adoption person, the cat foster person. So everybody that's a leader sees it that has anything to do with pulling cats out of the shelter. And then as soon as they get that, they send an email to the transport team, which is just transport, a bottle baby transport at austinpetslive.org. And that's got anybody who's ever signed up for transport for bottle babies. And um, generally, somebody will say, I'll go. And then they go to the shelter and pick up the kittens and then bring them over to us. So it's a communication system that happens under, under the radar um, but it's very effective in getting the kittens because this is it's labor intensive just to go get them. You know, it's like all the way across town, and by the time you get back, they're already emailed that they got another litter. So it's just this constant, uh, especially right now, going to get more and more kittens. Um, we test them on intake. We treat them for fleas and worms. We vaccinate if they're old enough, and um, we use one pound. I thought that ar- uh, article was good about the weight on ages. We use one pound as our decision whether or not to vaccinate, um, especially right now when there's panleukopenia. If you vaccinate earlier than that, you can actually give them panleukopenia. So it's, um, there is some concern about if they're um, less than four weeks of age. And then we feed them. We give them sub fluids if they need it, and we set them up for the day. Some of the lessons that we learned is that training is really important. This is not an easy job. It's not something – there's a lot of people with a lot of common sense and maybe experience taking care of bottle babies, but it's something that you have to teach what you do so that people do the same thing you do rather than 10 different methods of taking care of bottle babies. So even if somebody has all the experience in the world, they still have to go through training. We use a video to help reinforce that because we need volunteers desperately. So if you're only offering training once a week and your volunteers just aren't showing up, it's really hard to get more volunteers in there quick enough to make a difference. You can't afford to wait the whole seven days until the next training. Um, Weighing them before and after... And um, the kitten, fading kittens, we, it's just the nature of the beast. Like I said, you're going to have, we probably lose 20% of our kittens, and it's just, that's the norm. 
And um, I read a study, uh, not a study, there was a veterinarian on Venn talking about breeding cats. She breeds cats and that she loses 20% of her, kit, her neonatal kittens. And even with the best care in the world, that may be the norm for a litter. So I don't, we don't beat ourselves up about 20%. If it gets a lot higher than 20%, then we're, we start to uh, look at what's going wrong. We, lessons learned, it's easy to get overwhelmed. The kittens come in so fast. If you're in a, in a city like ours in the summertime, they come in so fast, you can be overwhelmed by, by the numbers before you even realize it because you've got all these arms doing different things and they're going to get kittens and all of a sudden you have 100 kittens. And um, so you, everybody needs to know the capacity. Everybody needs to know the chain of command so that nobody picks up kittens before they know whether or not we have space. Because if we don't have space, we can't take them. And um, getting fosters motivated, is it helps when you run out of space because then they start coming to pick up litters and um, helping to move them out of the ward. And another hard thing is that when you have so many kittens and they're hungry and you don't necessarily have enough staff, if you have a fading kitten, yes, we want to do the fading kitten protocol, but if you only have one person there, you need to empower them to not do it if they need to. Um, And that's a really hard lesson because the kitten's not suffering. It's fading. It's not in pain. Um, They don't have access to euthanasia. They can run it over to the clinic and euthanize it, or they can do the fading kitten protocol, or they can feed the rest of the kittens that haven't faded yet. And so when you've got those choices, I think it's um, important to empower everybody to keep focused on what the overall goal of the program is and that we're trying to save the most kittens. We're not going to save them all. It's physically impossible. And it's, it is a lot of work, but it is uh, well worth it when they survive and go on to live happy lives. And these are all some of our, our uh, graduates. That's it. <laughs>